Tajala Pengi, a Purin number two, Tamala, Tamdi Tajile, Yeming Suna Wanje, a Segio, Teningara, a Canada Docom Chuchigandrugi, Junechini, Sani Chinda to be a Tichudu, a Chuchigandru, Unyewe, Nimo Chadiwe over it, Tayins are Tering Kugab Simche, Chuchigandrugi Lodju, a Polaya, Shimju Ching, a Carol McGranna, and Yamdo, Inke Tony as a Jule, Chinangi. Um Tarana Shi San Nima Chinda Tubegi Tse Chugul Numola, Ten Canada Dokum Chigandrugi, Jule Kashi Chigi, Kama Chan Chamdo, Sherab Nyamdo, Puget Tony Ten Jule, Nangre and Number Two Siro Chi. This um uh oral is is an auspicious day. Uh, it's June 19, twenty two twenty twenty-two. That marks the sixty-fourth anniversary of Chujigandru. Um, 64 years ago, fearless leader Andrew Gombutashi, along with many, many brave Tibetans, established People's Army or Tenju Talama to fight back against uh, the oppressor Chinese inv invasion. Um, therefore, on behalf of, uh, of Canada Dokam Chujigandru Association, um, I would like to thank and welcome Carol McGranahan uh, for attending this virtual forum and discuss and, uh, and share her insights on why Chujigandru's history matters. Um, before we kick this off and uh, dive into uh, the topics, a um, uh, quick background about Carol. Um, she has received PhD in anthropology and history from the University of Michigan. Um, she's a professor of University of Colorado since 2001 uh, till now. Uh, and also on July 1st, 2022, Carol will be the chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Colorado. Um, she's also a recipient of many research grants and author of a numerous articles and, and has written uh, many uh, um, articles about Chujigandru, including her 2010 uh, book titled as Arrested Histories. Um, I hope you get it. I just got it from Amazon, um, and I think it was a great, great read. Um, and it's called uh, The Tibet and the Memories of a Forgotten War. Um, Carol began her research about Chujigandru in 1995 and spent five years uh, with Chujigandru veterans in India and Nepal. Uh, and since then, uh, Carol has continued um, to rally uh, and, and her research about Chujigandru. And she has uh, facilitated many, many presentations about Chujigandru in the US, uh, Canada, Switzerland, France, and India. Uh, wow, that's a that's a huge accomplishment, Carol. Um, Carol. Um, so, so Carol, um, uh, kick this off uh, with a very open-ended question, and we'll just sort of unpack and decompose uh, some of the topics. Um, um, I'll open the floor for you to open it up. Uh, why Chujigandu's history matters. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me and Tasha uh, Dile to everyone who is uh, watching. I uh, feel very lucky and very honored to be a scholar of Chujigandru and to have spent so much um, of my time um, and over the last several decades, right, for almost 30 years, uh, listening to the stories of the veterans, so of the Chujigandru Mami and trying to um, share not just with the world, but also with the Tibetan community across the generations, but also across uh, countries and also across the different choka, right? Why it is that Chushigandru history matters um, to Tibet, right? That this is a part of Tibetan history, not just of someone's personal story, um, but a history that is more important than I think um, aspects of the community have realized. Uh, so I guess the question is why, right? Why, as you have titled this, why does Chushigandru's history matter? And we might add, and to whom? So that part I want to make the claim for that it matters to Tibet. And here is why. Um, so in, uh, as, as you know, 1949, 1950, right? The, the Chinese PLA troops, these are the communist troops, right? Entered into Eastern Tibet, 1950, crossed the Drichu and start heading towards Hassa. 
Um, as we know, in the 1950s, uh, His Holiness and the Tibetan government tried to cooperate with Mao and with the PRC, and that did not work out. All right, so in 1959, um, Gil Rinpoche, the government, many Tibetans, right, leave and escape on foot. This is the history we all know. Right, and, and this is the history that um, Tibetan children often you know, know. What they don't know, usually, um, is that alongside all of these events was that ordinary Tibetans throughout Tibet rose up to try and defend their families, defend their leaders, whether it was um, kings, whether it was chiefs, whether it was lamas, Rinpoches, um, and to defend all the way up uh, to the government, the state, to His Holiness and to Tibetan Buddhism. And this story of ordinary Tibetans working together to defend their country against the Chinese has not become, um, a, I think, a strong enough part of Tibetan history, right? The stories are there, um, the memories survive. Books are starting to be written, um, more and more this history is included, the new history, um, section of the Tibet Museum that has just opened in Dharamsala has an entire section on the resistance. So more and more is coming, right? More knowledge, more stories, more understanding. Um, and yet here we are the day before June 16th, wondering who around the world might be marking this as an important day, right? To remember the sacrifices and the bravery of these soldiers. Thank you. Thank you, Karen for that open-ended answer and to sort of uh, unpack what actually happened uh, in early 50s where the PLA soldiers started to infiltrate from the east side. Can you tell us more about uh, what was happening around the regions of Kham and Amdo and, and what was the environment like at that time and how people reacted to those of invasion infiltrations? Sure. So the Chinese soldiers came to Eastern Tibet first because that's the part of Tibet right, that shares the border with China. And Kham, of course, shares a very long right, border with, with China, uh, Amdo as well, but Kham's allowed very easy access. So Kampas and Amdoas were the first really, right, to have Chinese soldiers coming and living in their communities. And at first, the soldiers had orders to be kind right, to the Tibetans, to treat them well. They treated them so well, right, that there's famous saving, sayings about how the, um, the Dayang, right, the silver coins that the Chinese had rained down from the sky, right, because the Chinese soldiers were so generous to the Tibetans. That only lasted for a short while though, right, and soon things changed. Um, changes were made at the political level, at social level, but most importantly, I think for Tibetans throughout Kham and Amdo, um, changes were made to religion, right? Demeaning events um, took place, destructive events took place in the monasteries as well as to both monks and to nuns. And then they began to be full on attacks, right? The Chinese PLA started actually attacking monasteries, bombing from above, uh, pulling down statues, burning pecha, or, or even worse, um, and forcing monks and nuns to disrobe, sometimes to even perform humiliating acts in public. So the situation grew really dire. And at first, I think just ordinary people, again, uh, farmers, nomads, um, you know, whoever they were, just people living in their villages, living in their towns, started just reacting where they were to defend themselves. So first you would just band together with the people from your village, right? Then maybe from your broader payu, right? From the different villages in the payu working together. Eventually, as the situation continued to get worse, right? To deteriorate, then people from the different payu started to coordinate. So you would have, for example, groups from Litam, right? Reaching out to groups from Nyarong, reaching out to Darkegumpa, reaching out to Ba, to Markham, to all of these places, saying, let's coordinate our efforts. Right? Rather than just acting from our own payu, let's all, you know, on the 10th of month, we will all do a coordinated attack, right? So starting to act together. And this is how it initially started, right? As just kind of like um, sort of unnamed, but Tensung Dang Lamar, right? Tensi Dang Lamar, right? Acting from the individual locations where the Chinese soldiers, right, were attacking, attacking local communities and attacking monasteries. So it started out informal and unorganized and then eventually progressed. Wow, that's, that's, that's incredible. So what you're saying is that uh, 
that as as the reforms were implemented and as they started tearing down how Tibetans live and their lifestyles, um, mm -hmm. you saw organically people sort of rallying together and uh, and sort of fighting against the oppressor. That's interesting. Right. Saying no, right? <laughs> we don't want this. We don't want you here. We don't want these changes made to our community and to our way of life. Absolutely. That's fascinating. Great. Okay, so so and that was happening in the eastern side of Tibet, uh, and obviously mm -hmm. from a geography perspective, uh, you know uh, that's where the PLA soldiers were were infiltrating and uh, coming into Tibet. And how how did the migration sort of occur, and how how did this 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 voluntary army uh, gradually started uh, rallying and gradually started uh, to go into like central Tibet, Lhasa? Mm -hmm. um, what's the story around there? Well, this is a story that's sad, right? Um, is that people were being killed, right? People were dying, and the Chinese army had many more people in it than did this citizens Tibetan army. The Chinese army also had modern weapons, right? And the Tibetan army did not have that. So the Tibetans mostly had their own knives and then they had very antiquated rifles, often Enfield rifles, right? From India that they had somehow um, received. Whereas the Chinese had machine guns, they had tanks, they had airplanes that could drop bombs. Right. So the two armies were very mismatched. One was also a professional army, you know, soldiers who were recruited. Here we go, some, some images. Um, and the Tibetans, again, were, they were monks who had disrobed to join. They, again, they were farmers, they were nomads. They were not trained professional soldiers. Um, they had to become soldiers very quickly. Right. So what happened is as the Chinese army con continued to grow and to defeat the Tibetans, um, the Tibetans moved to the West, right, and increasingly moved to seek refuge in central Tibet and in Lhasa. While this was happening, though, they were already strategizing for how they could organize in formal terms, right? So in 1955, um, groups of men from both Litang and Batang had gone to Lhasa to talk to um, Andrew Gomatashi, who would become the formal head of what would next be Chushigandru, but also had gone south to Kalampong uh, to meet with Jalutundu, with His Holiness's brother. And Kalampong is actually important here, as is Litang and Ba, right? So when we think of Kham, we think of the different provinces of Tibet, Kham was the center for trade, right? Kampas were the leading traders of Tibet. And so as traders, they knew all of the routes, you know, from China through Kham to Hassa, down to Kalampong in India, right? They had connections all along the way. They knew the paths, right? And so it was actually traders who were the ones who formed Chushigandru. Also, importantly, who had the money, right? To kind of to put um, not just their money, uh, but also to, to invest in the army, to invest in the organization. Um, and of course, um, given that this is a Tibetan event, Chushigandru really starts with religion, as we already heard, mm. uh, with the donation of a golden throne to His Holiness, with the conducting of a Chala Chakra ceremony. So these sorts of things also, this was a, an army that once it became a formal army was devoted to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. But that's what happened, right? The Chinese army was just too much. And so people had to shift right, to Lhasa, basically as refugees the first time around. Right? Um, and then it's in Lhasa where the formal organization of the army now with the name Chushigandru starts. And we've already heard in um, the beginning that this was a name given to the army by Trijang Rinpoche, right, by one of his holiness's tombs. Right, right. So so it's very interesting that, uh, you know, Carol, that, uh, that uh, these traders, um, um, instead of sort of safekeeping and safeguarding their sort of interest uh, or what have you, they actually sacrificed all their wealth and, and actually started to go against uh, the Chinese invasion and invaders. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's very interesting. Was that like a, like an alignment sort of a mindset with all the traders out there in Lhasa? My understanding is is that many, right, if not most of the traders, and again, not all the traders were Kampa, many were, there are also traders from Amdo and from U and from Tsang, um, that yes, 
many traders, because they were trading families and, and dealt basically in money, had a lot of money to invest. Other people just gave what they had, right? So this was truly a community event, right? If you only had, say, um, uh, one piece of brocade to offer, that this was the precious thing that your family had that you could offer to this mission, this initiative, mm -hmm. then that's what you gave. People like Andrit Song, which was a big trading family, they had more to give. So, but the point is that um, this particular initiative, right, which took place in Plaza, might have been Kampa organized in the beginning, but actually people from throughout Tibet, um, you know, who were centered in Lhasa, because Lhasa, of course, was a cosmopolitan place where people from throughout Tibet came, um, right. gave to this, you know, gave their valuables, um, as well as their prayers, right, you know, to this, to make an offering to his holiness, of course, you know, it is also a good deed. It's a way to accumulate merit. And here in this moment of crisis, right, of the Chinese army being here, there was even more of an urgency. Um, so the contributions to this was not just from the soldiers, but from the broader Tibetan community. Interesting, interesting. Okay, and uh, okay, so let's let's get to the uh, the favorite topic of of mine personally, Andrew Gumbatashi, the fearless mm -hmm. leader, a visionary, strategist, um, and people's person. Um, so tell me a bit more about Andrew Gumbatashi. Obviously, he was a wealthy trader. He was located and based uh, perhaps in Lhasa because that's the cosmopolitan uh, mm -hmm. region out there. Um, uh, so, so give me a, a Bob on on Andrew Gumbutashi, um, and, and we'll sort of unpack his story as we go along. Sure. I mean, the Andritsan family, I think, had been uh, traders for a while, and most of the traders, once you achieved a certain level of success, then you would have a home, if not an office in Hassa, right? Not just in your um, in your home Payul. He was from Litang. Um, and, and so that is something that you know, it's important to realize also that uh, many Tibetans at this time, again, traveled frequently, right? To, to different, not just throughout Tibet, but also to China and to India. So the Andritsang family with Andru Gopatashi as his, at, his, at the head, um, would have been one that was moving in these directions, right? That had familiarity with both sides, um, that had some degree of education, which at the time in Tibet was still somewhat rare outside of the monasteries, right. but really had an awareness, right? Kind of of the world and of politics and of history. So when the group of men like went from, um, you know, six smaller traders from Litang went to Lhasa to talk to Andrew Gompatashi, right? He received them with open arms arms like that yes this is something we need to do and so he was responsible for organizing in Hassa, um, which meant a series of meetings bringing together people um, to plan the events that led up to june 16 1958 right which was the formal mm -hmm. inauguration um, but he was also coordinating with down in kalampong where jalutunduk was actually he his mission like the charge to him was to reach out to foreign governments right and he reached out to the united states so I guess I want to say that what Andrew Gopatashi was, was the head, there were many people who were involved in making this army um, organizational um, and, and a success, right? To the degree, degree right. that it did have many successes and not just on the battlefield, right? But so Andrew Gopatashi was kind of the center, right? The heart right. and you needed someone to take that initiative and to take charge. So when that initial group of men came to him, he responded with a resounding yes, right? And began to organize and bring together traders from Amdo, with traders from Kham, with Tibetan government officials, with representatives from the Tibetan government army, right? So he was placed, he had the stature um, as someone from Kham, right? Who is not Gujarat, right? Who is not an aristocrat, because the aristocrats are all in Hassa. Right. Right? They are not Kampa. Right. He had enough social standing in the Hassa community to be able to bring people together and to bring them together secretly, we should add. right? All of this right. is taking place uh, clandestinely, secretly, so that the Chinese do not know. Right? Um, so there we go. You know, <laughs> There's at least some more on Andrew Gopatashi, but the entire, the Andritsang family, the Andritsurba family, the Jatatsang family, like lots of families from Litong, um, as a result, were very much you know, right in the, um, the center of Chushigandru. Well, 100%, and that's that's incredible story. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously leadership matters, right? Um, you know, uh, when you have a strong leader, people follow and, and rally behind the leader. So I think Andrew Gopatashi was uh, a really, really like, uh, bigger than 
image, sort of a leader who actually lead people and, um, and, and henceforth created this, this voluntary army that was based in Utsang, uh, Kamba and the uh, Amdo regions. Um, so, but, but the environment back then must be very tense though, because things were scaling up. Um, the heavy handed tactics were sort of a doubling up in Lhasa or what have you. Uh, and I, I heard stories about Andrew Gumbutashi sort of a, um, you know, strategizing uh, the golden throne. And through that golden throne, there were secret uh, meetings happening with various leaders or what have you. Like, can you unpack that story for us? Well, sure. Um, although I, I hesitate, I don't want anyone to get the impression that the golden throne was just a cover, right, <laughs> for meetings. Um, there, it was also a deeply sincere, right, activity and the way to, in some ways, to consecrate right, or to, or to initiate, again, the creation of the formal army. However, it all provided cover, right, in that it would, it would have been a normal event for a group of Tibetans to come together to order, uh, not to order, excuse me, to organize um, ceremonies, donations, offerings to His Holiness, again, especially in a time of political crisis. So those activities would not have seemed suspicious um, to either Tibetan or Chinese authorities. But they also, right, serve to ground, again, this um, initiative, right, and to ground it properly per Tibetan cultural protocols, right, of, you know, how do we launch this in an auspicious sense, right, and properly, given that we are taking on the defending of Buddhism by becoming warriors, right, right. how do we do so in a way that honors Buddhism, right? and his holiness in this moment, because what we are doing is kind of walking a line, right, of, of um, meritorious behavior. Right. Well, that's great. And, and, and to a point, like you just said it, I think it hit nail on the head. Uh, you know, living Buddha, which is his holiness, the Dalai Lama, and, uh, and everybody wanted to do everything to protect him. Um, um, and can you tell me, tell all of us actually, who's who's on the on the social media platform, uh, what was the situation like, and what was what led to the decision of His Holiness, sort of uh, uh, making decisions to to sort of uh, get out of Lhasa and get in uh, to India, and like what was what was the strategy, what was the plan, and what was um, you know Chujigandru's army sort of a role in terms of creating that safe okay. passage? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, the, the 1950s in general, right? This is one of the most important um, decades right, for contemporary Tibetan history. And, and it started actually, I'll go back to like 1951 for a minute, um, with a group of men from, again, pan Tibetan from throughout Tibet who created something called Mimang Sopa, right? Which was a people's movement, right? A um, movement kind of for democracy. So there were multiple initiatives to try and present alternatives, right? To to Chinese rule, but also to try and modernize the Tibetan government, which was something that had been going on since the passing of the 13th Dalai Lama, right? Figuring out how does Tibet coalesce and come together in the modern world now as a, as a political entity, as a state. Um, these things in general don't work, again, because of just the power uh, and the dominance of the Chinese. So while His Holiness and um, you know his representatives in the government are trying to cooperate, and these are some of the stories people do know, His Holiness goes to Beijing and you know, travels with like, the Panchen Lamas there too. And there's that famous meeting with Mao where um, they're together you know, in Beijing for the duration of the journey. And at first His Holiness thinks that, oh, maybe Mao is okay. And then it's like on the very last end, very last day, the end of his journey, Mao says something to him, and His Holiness reases, realizes that Mao is actually an enemy of the Dharma, right? An enemy of, of the Buddha, right? So there are these genuine, very sincere, right, efforts from His Holiness, right, to try and 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 make this work. Eventually, um, His Holiness, as well as the Tibetan people, realize this isn't possible. But the real turning point that I think you might be alluding to is when the Chinese army issues an invitation to His Holiness to attend a theatrical performance at a Chinese army camp in Lhasa. But they tell him, don't bring your bodyguards, come alone. Oh, wow. And so that invitation, you know, with the specific instruction, do not bring your bodyguards, you know, is a signal immediately, 
right, to his holiness's bodyguards and to government officials, as well as to Chushigandru, who at the time were cooperating with the government to protect his holiness, that the Chinese were planning something. And the belief was that if his holiness attended this theatrical performance he had been invited to, that he was going to be kidnapped. Okay. So, you know, the um, state oracle goes into, into trance, Nechung, and Nechung basically says, go, go now, right? Tells his holiness, like, do not wait. And so they depart Lhasa in the middle of the night, right? And his holiness is dressed as a lay person, as just an ordinary Tibetan. He crosses the river, right, right south of Lhasa. And when he crosses the river and arrives in Loka, then he is in Chushigandru territory. And from dawn, until he crosses the border into India, he is in the safe hands of Chushigandru, right? And of the escort who safely deliver him, right, to India. Right, right. And and, and, and that's a great account. Um, and, and if you can sort of uh, perhaps add more details around it, because because I was also reading, uh, you know, um, uh, your your book and, uh, and other, um, other stories around that travel. I believe it was something, it was a very well organized, strategically placing Trujigandru sort of an army on, on locations um, to ensure that they would evade Chinese uh, you know, army. And I believe there was a CIA involvement uh, while um, Trujigandru was escorting his holiness to India. Like, can you sort of uh, elaborate on that story? Yes. Um, so let's remember that Chushigandru um, was formally inaugurated as an army in Ju June 16th, 1958. Now we are talking less than one year later, right? March of 1959, right? April of 1959, when they have already organized themselves to such a degree and created chains of command right? So different positions, with battalions, um, and the battalions were organized according to Payu. But different people, you know, and messengers going from camp to camp, right? So really, right. you know, a very short time, right, had created this structure of organization. I want to emphasize, wow. this was entirely by Shushigandru. Wow. The CIA involvement is a different component. Right. So the CIA had started uh, training Tibetan soldiers in 1957. So they're kind of happening at the same time. And these are men who are sent directly from Andrew Gompotashi and from Jalo Tundu, right? First trained on the island of Saipan, um, which is in the Pacific. So a very hot tropical island in April, 1957. Groups of these men parachuted into Tibet in 1957, uh, autumn in the fall. Two of these were a telegraph team um, and names uh, are some of the most well-known names among Chushigandru, uh, Atar Norbu and Lotse. Yeah. Both of them were from Litang. And so mm -hmm. they accompanied his holiness on his escape. So there was the Chushigandru escort and bodyguard, and then there were the two telegraph operators. And they were sending messages about his holiness's journey to the CIA back in the United States. So though they were pretty much the only people in the world, right, who knew what was going on, was kind of the Tibetans who were escorting His Holiness, and then the CIA received messages you know, back in Washington D.C. Um, the Chinese, uh, of course, as well, but was not announced to the world, you know, in the world's media until His Holiness safely um, crossed the border. Oh, that's 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 incredible. That's incredible. Okay. Um, any other interesting stories while His Holiness is sort of a, um, traveling under the cover um, to India? Like, is there any other like interesting tales uh, or stories around it uh, that, that that's enchanting? I mean, there's and, a, oh, we've never heard of it. Yeah, many. I think that those are best told in the villages, you know, the routes along the way, yeah. because I think the villagers who lived in those, um, the people who lived in those villages. It was very clear as the His Holiness's party came through that this supposedly ordinary man riding a horse was not very ordinary at all. Right. Right? Right. <laughs> that he was actually someone very important and very special. And so I think these are the kind of histories, right? Like these stories that are very local of people's experience of His Holiness coming through their village in disguise, 
right? right? That, we, that haven't fully um, been told yet. And part of that is because these villages, right? And those villagers remain in China. And in China, you right. can't tell the stories in the same way. Um, you have to tell them differently. Right? Uh, they're not they're I... not endearing stories of recognizing his holiness when he's in disguise. Um, some of the other stories that are that have been poignant um, and touching for me to hear have been those of sitting down with men who were part of the escort. So um, when I started doing this research in the mid '90s, um, I stayed with a family and we were living in basically. The, um, a Tibetan carpet factory, right? So it was a compound where there was a place where people are making the carpets, but then all of the families living, you know, living in the compound as well. And right. one of the men who lived, one of the men who lived there, um, someone I knew as Pala Yampe, right? Um, it just have what a simple name, right? Just uh, He had been part of the escort. And oh. I still remember the day when we sat down together and he took out, I don't have a photo here to hold up, um, but he held up the photograph that he had on his altar of himself and several of the other soldiers standing with his holiness right on that journey and of the pride and of the emotion right, that he felt in sharing that photograph and reflecting on what it had been like to provide service and protection to his holiness in that manner. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Carol, for sharing those uh, intimate stories. And uh, and just to point out uh, the communist parties of attitude and the actions, uh, especially in the past, which would probably predict what would happen in the future. Also, uh, you know, how they sort of treated uh, the Panjian Lamas, uh, his mysterious death, um, and right. uh, what's been happening with the Panjian Lamas' reincarnation. Um, so blatantly in front of the entire world um, to do whatever they want. Um, so I think it was it's such an incredible achievement for all the Tibetans, I think, uh, and obviously particularly to, to Shishi Gandhi to safely escort His Holiness out of that environment uh, to India. Um, otherwise, you never know what, what, what could have happened, right, Carol? What are your right. thoughts on that? Exactly. No, there's so many, um, even now, continuities, right, that, that I see. Um, so, for example, the uprising in 1959 that took place in Lhasa, um, that was not matched again until 2008 when we saw protests throughout Tibet. And again, people from all walks of life, not just monks, but, you know, taxi drivers, again, farmers, nomads, school teachers, carpenters, you know, everyone. Right? Um, protests and some of the the language used um, by these self-immolators and what it is they are calling for is incredibly reminiscent of the things that the Chushigandru soldiers were calling for. And that was unity among Tibetans, right? For Tibetans to join together, right? To defend his holiness, defend Tibet, defend Buddhism against the Chinese communists. Right, right such a strong and important message, especially in today's day and age. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Carol, for sharing that. Okay, so so we're getting into the next segment um, of uh, CIA. Um, I also recall some of the stories and some of the some of your presentations early on um, is that uh, there was a friendship being built uh, with, uh, with the US CIA operators uh, and with the Tibetans and how they sort of trained in Boulder, Colorado. And also, also like a perspective and story from the CIA uh, personnel saying that hey, this was this was a very special mission. Um, so, so can you unpack and elaborate a bit more on that? Sure. So again, the CIA got involved. Uh, the USA decided in 1956 to support Tibetans. Um, the CIA training began in 1957. And then in 1958, they started training Tibetans here in Colorado at a high altitude um, former army camp that had been used during World War II. So that happened from 1958 through 1964 and several hundred Tibetans were trained there. And this was a secret camp. It was tucked back like behind, <laughs> behind a mountain, several valleys behind. So no one knew it was there. Like the local American um, you know, population had no idea. 
that the Tibetans were there. Those Tibetans, when they went back, some of them parachuted into Tibet. Some of them went up to Mustang, which was um, where the Chujigandru military base was in exile. And some were involved in training soldiers in India, whether it was through Chushigandru or whether it was through one of the Indian, um, whether it was Establishment 22 or, or, or one of the Indian groups, right, that was kind of an offshoot of Chushigandru. Um, but those men who were trained here, right, and lived in this secret military camp, right, high up in the Rocky Mountains, um, lived side by side with their American teachers. And these were... Um, like real relationships, right? They would be in class during the daytime and your class could in, in be anything from learning about world history and politics to learning about telegraph, learning how to operate a radio. Um, many radio operators were trained and there were teams who were posted throughout the Himalayas, both Nepal and India, as well as inside Tibet. Um, guerrilla warfare was part of the training. One of the stories that I, I think I included in the book is that um, the American teachers, the CIA trainers, tried to train the Tibetans uh, how to cover your tracks when traveling in snow. And they said that that was like the worst lesson they had ever done because the Tibetans turned it around and were like, "You have there is nothing you can teach us about going in snow. <laughs> like, we, are, right. we are the experts on that. So it was like the lesson yeah. was over before it even started. Um, the other thing that many of the CIA um, officers with whom I spoke, and I did a lot of interviews and research with them as well, said that they had two things. One, that Tibetans were some of the best practical jokers they had ever met, that they were the world's greatest lovers of horses. And so I guess there were a lot of horses at this secret camp um, and just a lot of love, right? And, and Tibetans just like truly doting on and taking care of the horses again in the way that even some of the CIA men who had grown up on ranches right and thought they were horsemen said they had you know was unparalleled to their experience um that, so those are sort of the fun things but the most important one is that to a um t right every single cia officer um with whom i spoke right who had been posted at camp hale um, or dumra i was it was known in tibetan said that they had never worked before or since with another group who believed as strongly in their cause and who were as committed to it as the Tibetan soldiers. Sonamla, are you frozen or am I frozen? Okay, sorry, I'll, I'll continue. Um, so there are many stories. Uh, that can be told, you know, from the CIA camp. Um, and, and while that is important, I think what's important to, to emphasize is actually what the soldiers did when they returned. Um, one of the things that the Tibetan soldiers did when they were training in Colorado was to create a series of history books, um, illustrated pamphlets, where they were trying to tell, right, their fellow Tibetans who were still in the villages what was going on. You know, what are China's um, goals in taking over Tibet? How can we join right, with people elsewhere to kind of to fight back? What's happening in other parts of the world, in Hungary, for example, right? And remember, this was the Cold War when it was the big fight um, yeah, at the time right, between democracy and communism, right? So these were the things that the Tibetan soldiers themselves were trying to write about and trying to kind of teach, right? So Chushigandru, as, as much as we think of it as an army, in some ways was also an educational institution, a social organization, um, and a welfare group. And the, these last things, I think, are the ones that continue to this day. There's no longer an active military present named Shushigandru, right? However, there are Tibetans um, you know, working in the Indian army um, and Indian you know, units outside of the army. But Shushigandru itself remains active, right? And, and remains, hopefully, right, vital to the community. I guess at this point, moment, um, I'm presuming people can hear me. I'm, I'm not really sure where Sonamante has gone. Um, I, I'd like to just acknowledge, I've been trying to look at the comments um, uh, in the chat, uh, Anak Sitin and Tinli Soma reading the, the stories that you've shared here, um, and just my respect um, for your family members um, who is bravely, right, um, joined the fight and then suffered 
uh, as, as a result. Um, this part of the history, kind of the fact that people, um, many people did die. Um, that's something that's awkward, you know, to acknowledge. It remains something that we don't fully know enough about, right? Even in terms of the overall Chinese invasion of Tibet and the number of deaths. And we don't know that because the Chinese government doesn't release that information. Um, but there were many people, um, brave individuals, men and women, and I'll come back to that in a second, right? Um, who actually were deeply injured you know, permanently injured. And whether the injury was again to, to your hand, to your foot, or maybe to your sem, right? To your, your heart, to your mind, um, to in English, what we would call your soul, um, it, it, it is something also I think that needs to be acknowledged. Many of the men who I did research with, who I interviewed with, those who had been monks before the war, right? Who took off their robes, uh, could not become monks again after the war, but they were the most religious people I've ever encountered in my life in the way that they lived their life and structured their day around reading Pecha, uh, going for Kora, and just the way that they um, grounded themselves in the world. Other men who had been traders or farmers before the war became monks after the war, right? And that was their way to try and atone, to try and, and make sense and to heal. I think in some ways, right, for everything that they had seen and witnessed during the war. So um, all of this, um, the women part, let me just quickly say, women were part of the fighting before uh, the army became the formal Chushigandru army. So at the moment that the army officially became offered and devoted to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, women were involved. Once it became officially offered to His Holiness, then it was no longer appropriate for women to serve and for women to be on the battlefield. But so up until that moment, it was both men and women. After that, it was um, an army of just men. But I think it's important to honor, to also acknowledge that some of the heroes in here, um, in this history are women, right? As well as men. Do we have Sonamwaji back? All right. Um, I, I do actually do want to so touch upon the last question. Um, the relationship of the, the Tibet government to Chushigandru remains um, a bit in some ways of an arrested history, right? So there's the government and then there's the people who comprise the government. So even when we're talking about the CIA, there's in relationship to Tibet, there's the people who are in charge, right? Back in Washington, D.C., who were very distant from Tibet their relationship to the situation was very different from that of the men, the American men and women who worked at Camp Hale, right? Who lived side by side with the Tibetan soldiers, right? They have different relationships. They're not one and the same. Um, Tibetan government is, is very similar, right? Um, there were officials in the Tibetan government who were trying very hard to cooperate with China. And there were officials in the Tibetan government and Tibetan army, right? Who were working behind the scenes, again, secretly with Chushigandru. We ever fully know, you know, what the um, what the relationship was beyond kind of just a secret relationship, how much was authorized, how much was not. Um, it's difficult because the archives that remain in Lhasa, we, meaning those of us who are in exile, do not have access to, right? Even if they still exist, even if they weren't destroyed or burnt. Right? So there are elements of Tibetan history, not just about Chushigandru, but the 1950s in general, that because they are behind, you know, we'll say the Chinese, it's not the paywall or the firewall, but they're just within China, um, that scholars do not necessarily have access to, regardless of whether you are a Tibetan scholar, a Chinese scholar, or an Inji like myself. Welcome back, Sonala. <laughs> that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And and uh, uh, Carol, um, we, we had chats early on and you talked about some of the images that uh, that uh, the soldiers who are getting trained in Colorado wrote uh, in terms of having three Tibetans and a monk sort of a raising their hands together to sort of a, you know, calling for unity mm -hmm. and democracy or what have you. Can you tell us that story? Sure. Do, do I have the ability to share an image? I don't know if I do or not. Um, I'm quickly look up share screen. Let let me um, get that. So I was just sharing with everyone that the soldiers in Colorado created these books, um, illustrated pamphlets. So they were mostly drawings with some text. 
that they um, would airdrop or carry into Tibet. So I want to share just one with you, if I can. Um, here, it doesn't, wait for a second, it doesn't want to let me. Oh, really? It can't figure out what one it is. Hold on one second, everyone. It's a little hard. I think it's this one. Unable to share the screen. Um, it looks like someone would need to give me permission behind the scenes. Uh, Carmela, maybe if you could do that. Um, but so again, as I was sharing before, Shushi Gandru was initiated. Um, the initiative came from Kampas in part because Kampas were one of the communities that was, um, you know, first bore the brunt, right, of the of Chinese attack. Um, right. But later, Amduas were in there. There were even, um, you know, Utsangbas, there, there were Ubas, there were Songbas, there were Tibetan government um, army soldiers who defected to join. Um, there were some who maybe, you know, joined with permission. There was even a Chinese soldier, and some of you might know this, Jalo Santashi, uh, who took on a, a Tibetan name. He had been part of the Republican, right, or Nationalist Army and was anti-communist and so joined with the Tibetans and lived out his days. Um, I want to say in Camp 5 in Bailakupi. I never met him, so I, I, I might be wrong on what exact camp. Um, but really, there were many people involved. Do I now have the ability to share? Should I try again? Let's see if I can show you this one image that I think captures what I'm talking about. Uh, it's not letting me show. Um, unfortunately, I, I guess we can't do that. But I think this has been lost um, in contemporary politics right now. Right. So one of the things that's happened in exile um, has been what does it mean to be unified? Right. And how do you maintain your regional identity or your Paiul identity um, at the same time as a Tibetan identity? So, so these are some of the things right, have meant that this message and this aspect of Chushigandru ha has not really emerged as part of its history. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for sharing that. Uh, do you have the ability and the capability to share that image? Probably not. Um, I guess. I think Karma said it's not possible. I'll give it one more shot. Okay. Okay. But yeah. No, Sounds it's it's good. not. Um, not at the moment. And, 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 unfortunately. And I believe I believe uh, I believe the essence of that story and the and the image during that time, it's all about like calling for unity, right? Like calling, um, rallying everyone all three problems and obviously i think it's very interesting that because I, I saw that image that you shared carol um, and we were sp speaking mm -hmm. early on where even even a monk who also sort of symbolizes the the religion aspect like all four of men were getting together mm -hmm. to protect dharma to protect the tibetan identity and uh to serve his holiness so so that's a that's a really really cool story so so thank you so right. let me i so, can't make it, so I, I know show um, the image Oh, so Namla, let me read you one thing quickly. So I, I've translated all of these books and I'm hoping to publish them sometime, but let me at least share the words with people who are listening. So if, if you can't see the images, you can, you can listen to just this. So this is the beginning of one of the books. And, and this, I'm just gonna read the English translation. So it says, all Tibetans, men and women, old and young must remember this. For the sake of regaining independence of the whole of Tibet, we must sacrifice our lives and enduring whatever adversity befalls us, fight both on days and in nights. We must rebel against the sweet mouth and dark hearted activities of the red Chinese. So just it, it, that's just all I'll read. Um, but just to give you a sense right of the seriousness and of the passion. Right. And of speaking to all Tibetans, men and men, young and old. Right. Now is the time to come together for this, to fight day and night. Right. For our country. Well, that's amazing. And, uh, and uh, yeah, like I like I can only imagine like back then during that time where everything was like at the peak in terms of Chinese of oppressing and military tactics and cracking down like there were so many brave men and women who stood up um so so that's a that's an incredible story okay uh okay so, so um my second question is that uh, 
um, Dashu obviously is is the pioneer, and and we all know about him, and uh, and uh, yeah, what a what a personality. But other than Andu Gumbutashi, like if you had to stack rank like five top leaders who really rallied, who had interesting stories, and you know, while you were interviewing like hundreds of veterans, and through those stories, like were you able to sort of say like these were the these were the leaders and these were the uh, participants who actually told us this story, hence makes them really special. Like what's your thought on that? My initial thought is there's no way that I would ever stack rank <laughs> the okay. heroes of Chushigandru. I think every Paiyu, right, every battalion um, had their heroes, and most of them we don't know their stories because right. some of them died, and their their fellows who they were fighting with weren't able to escape. Um, right. And so their stories haven't been told. So even someone like myself, right, who has researched Chushigandru history for so long, doesn't know the stories um, of all of the individuals who who fought and who were truly, right, truly brave in ways beyond belief. Um, I do know that uh, Chushigandru uh, in Majakatila back in the 1990s had been working for several decades on a project to compile battalion histories. So one day, perhaps, these histories will be released, right? And this is part of my work also is... Um, you know, of asking the question of why you know, don't we know Chushigandu history? I mean, I could I could give you many names of people who I've met personally or read about, you know, who were phenomenal. Uh, Jatu Wangdu, um, who was one of the leaders in Mustang and who was assassinated by the Nepali army as he was trying to escape to India at the close of Mustang. Um, Gail Losanjampa, who um, was someone who was sent by the CIA to take over from Baba Yeshi. And Baba Yeshi was the general in Mustang in a very traditional Tibet. And uh, Losan Jampa had been sent to take over as the new, like newfangled, right? The modern type of soldier. And he got there and Baba Yeshi said, no, you know, I don't care if the CIA sent you to be in charge, I'm in charge. And Losan Jampa to his credit said, I respect that, right? And, and, and so just all of these men, right? Who also had to negotiate relationships across, um, you know, not just the battlefield, but across connections, right? Like, who do you trust when you go into battle? Who are the people you want by your side? You know, if you are from Ba, right, and this person is from, I don't know, Ripgong, how do you know that you can trust that man, right? So thinking also about what does it mean to assemble around you, right, a group who you are going to trust with your life? Like the sea, I understand that or didn't understand the Tibetan ways of doing that. I mean, so many people, uh, Dutch, Ratu Ngawang, actually you had just showed Ratu Ngawang's um, image before, another phenomenal leader. Uh, Machik Jangrilaja, uh, whose book, uh, his family just wrote his story. The book just came out right before the pandemic in 2019. Um, someone who had been overlooked, right? Uh, so th I think there's a lot of overlooked heroes. Um, there's no, there's no limit, actually. Um, I could go on and on. Right. I, I remember a story, um, um, I believe it's in your book too, uh, Bawa Yishi, who was, who was telling you, said, if we weren't boiling water, because obviously we love tea, we were actually fighting the China, like the Chinese army. So that's, that's, that's. Interesting. That was actually Baba Leshe. So that was Leshe, well, not Baba, Baba Yishi. Yeah. Um, but they're both Babas. Right. Um, Baba yeah. Lekshe was someone I spent a lot of time with in both Kalimpong and in um, Kathmandu in the Boda area. And he was someone, okay. he had been a trader before. So he was a trader, you know, just a small trader who did the route from Ba to Hasa to Kalimpong. Right. And he joined with Chushigandru, left his entire family back in Ba. Right. Uh, after the war, he became a monk. And he actually, yeah. it's his words that I end my book with. Let me just share those now for anyone who's okay. unaware of them. They're very, very powerful. Um, I'm getting there. Just give me one second. Absolutely. Baba Leshe said this to me once. We were talk talking about fighting and talking about, I mean, I, I would spend so much time with him. We would just sit and drink tea. I, I would spend as much time with him as I could you know, and just learn right from him. He said, without knowledge, 
one can only fight for small things. So without knowledge, right? One can only fight for small things. And history is an important form of knowledge, right? Right. Like we need to know our history, no matter who you are in the world, right? In order to take on the struggles that matter, right? The fights, the battles that matter. Wow, that's profound. So can you read it again? Yeah, it was. Sure. Well, I, I have a nice. Without knowledge, one can only fight for small things. Right. Okay. That's deep. That's deep. And uh, um, so it's like, hey, we all need to sort of rise up uh, above our petty uh, small disputes or what have you to look at the bigger picture and then and then fight for the cause. I guess. Right. Wow. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good right. one. Take the time to educate yourself and to understand what's going on before you take action. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. And uh, and uh, um, my final question uh, was is about like, so what do we what do we what should we take from this conversation? Um, I think that answer was there in all your stories as you were telling and and having a conversation around it but like if you had to summarize what is the call to action for the tibetan youth um and that's the target audience for today's session um and what should we be mindful about and uh and what are the next steps that we should be taking um based on your research and based on the history about chujigan well i would say that Knowing history, like so learning about the past is important for envisioning possibility in the future, right? So think, what were these Tibetans, your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents fighting for, right? What mattered deeply to them, even if they couldn't be successful at the time, right? What, what is there to learn from these struggles that will bring you forward in successful ways? Right, right. Interesting, interesting. Okay, Carol, um, um, that would be the set of questions that I prepared for you. And thank you very much for sort of unpacking it and making sure that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that the audience on this call, and obviously we're going to share that on our, in our Facebook, uh, Canada.com, Chishikandu's Facebook and YouTube. And I'm sure like folks from India, because right now it's really, really early out there, will be able to see, especially the younger generations. And, uh, and uh, you know what? I guess the, uh, the valuable lessons that we've learned from this conversation is to sort of invest time in learning about our history. Um, and, and that should pave uh, what the future should be. So, yes. so thank you, Carol. Before you leave, Carol, any words of this that you want to share with the audience or with the Tibetan community? Well, just the history is not boring. I know that my own kids sometimes tell me, oh, history is boring, mom. And I say, actually, you need to find the stories, right? Find someone who right. is a good storyteller, whether it's they're speaking to you in person or in a book, and start listening, right? Find them. There's Chushigandru stories and cartoons, right? So just go and, and look. I'm looking actually some of the um, questions over here. I would say just do these sorts of events. You know, anyone who's listening, how to make Chushigandru history more visible, share it with people. Right. Tell right. people about it. Have a June 16th celebration. Invite your friends who are not part of the Chushigandru community. Right. Invite them to learn about it. Um, I know that I benefit you know, as from telling these histories and from learning these stories. And I know your community it will even deeper in even deeper ways you know, than is possible for me. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Sonamla and Karmala. Thank you, Carol, uh, and and hope to hope to meet you again very soon. I know that you're coming to Toronto in, in around October of this, this year. And, uh, we'll yes, so hopefully I will get to meet uh, meet, meet some folks uh, in Jameson in October. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Carol. On behalf of Canada, Dokam Chuji Gandru, uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for investing uh, valuable lessons and, uh, in, 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 you know, studying and sharing your insights uh, about Chuji Gandru's history and obviously Tibet. Um, so so uh, much, much thank you. Um, so with that note, we'll end our session and uh, take care. And uh, also on the, on the final note, uh, 
Um, we have a picture coming up uh, right now uh, next Sunday. Um, next Sunday on uh, June 19th, um, Chamdu Sharap, uh, he will be having a conversation around uh, Chujigandru's history with a few of the members of Canada, the Kam Chujigandru. Sanyima, Chinde Tubegi, Tari Chugula, Tene, one of Canada, the Kam Chujigandru, Julia Kaji Chigi, Kewang Chamdu Sharap Yamdo, Dulain Chigide, Tains are numbered so. Uh, uh, Bye, everyone. <laughs>